nuclear weapon is President. the President of the United States. Nobody else. Now, wherever the President travels, he has an aide that travels with him that takes, carries around a little uh, briefcase called a football. Now, let's just for the sake of argument say, well, the President has decided for, it is, it's time for us to retaliate. What he's going to do is going to send a coded launch order from that football to the war room at the White House. That message will then get transmitted to us from one of two sources, SAC headquarters, Omaha, Nebraska, 15th Air Force, Riverside, California. It's a pair of speakers for the commander, another pair over here for the deputy. And then the electronics on level three will, will screen out the weaker of the two signals so you get a signal. And you're going to hear a warning sound. And we hear that warning sound. Commander, you and your deputy are going to pick up your emergency action message books. Now, if you open it up, you're going to see there's a form. And what you're going to hear is something like this. Actually, that goes on for 35 characters. And the two of you are going to sit and fill out those, those forms using, again, this other state-of-the-art device known as a grease pencil. At the end of that, that transmission, end of message, repeat message, at which point the two of you will trade books. Go ahead, please. And you're going to read each other's work. If you are 100% accurate, the two of you now have the authority to go over there and open the emergency war order safe, that red safe. Crews often called that the go-to-war safe. Now, if you notice, that safe has two combination locks on it. One lock belongs to the commander. The other one belongs to the deputy. You don't know each other's combination, so the two of you have to agree that you're going to take those locks off. So you do that, and the first thing we're going to do is authenticate this launch. Now, embedded in that message is a string of seven characters. You're going to look at the first two characters and find the envelope that has those first two characters on the outside, say Golf Alpha. You'll open that up, and you're going to extract a little plastic cookie. Now you're going to look at the final five characters in that string that I was talking about, and compare that with the five characters on this cookie. And if they exactly agree, this is not a drill. We now know we have an authenticated order from the President of the United States that we're going to launch our nuclear weapon. What else do we do? Embedded in that message is a way to calculate a launch time. The deputy will write that across the face of the clock. Greenwich Mean Time again. Might be immediately, might be two hours from now, might be tomorrow morning. It all depends on the war strategy at the Pentagon. Next thing. Remember Chuck talked about the butterfly valve lock? Yes? No? <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, that's the most important safety feature on this whole site to prevent unauthorized or unintentional launches. Now, when you go back up topside and, and walk around, go look at the first stage engine. And what you're going to see are two, uh, an engine that has two thrust chambers. Each thrust chamber has an inlet line for fuel and an inlet line for the oxidizer. Four lines. All four of those lines have to be open for this missile to fly. All four of those lines are equipped with butterfly valves, like this, closed and open. One of the oxidizer lines has a lock on it. And in order, in order for us to allow this missile to fly, we have to unlock that. And what, well, the way we do that is by entering a secret code, six-digit code that came in with that launch order. It's the only and the first time the crew ever knew what that code was. So the commander is going to order her BMAT to enter that right up here. There's six little thumb wheels. Now, each thumb wheel contains 16 characters. So how many possible combinations <coughs> is that? 16 to the sixth power? <laughs> I heard the answer. A lot. That's it. <laughs> actually, commander, they taught you that when you're training. <laughs> it's what it is. It's actually slightly less than 16,800,000, and only one works. Now, those sound like pretty good odds, don't they? The Air Force didn't think so. They, in order, what they did, they put a tries counter in here, so you had six chances to guess that code. In order to prevent some board crew member from 3 o'clock in the morning to come in here and start to fool around to see if they could guess the code, you had six chances to do that. If on the seventh chance, even if you got it right, this whole facility went on lockdown and it would take many hours of many technicians' work to bring the site back to active status. 
Commander, if that happened when your crew was on duty, you have not enhanced your military career. <laughs> Nobody touched that. So what have we done? We've authenticated the launch, written the launch time, unlock the butterfly valve, the missile's going to fly now. Last thing we do is we extract a pair of launch keys. There's one here for the commander. And Deputy, you have one way back over here. Two keys. These two keys, they're kind of like your car. They're, 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 uh, they're spring-loaded in the off position. They must be turned within two seconds of each other and held for five seconds. Now, notice how far apart those keys are. Actually, I measured it one time. It's 87 inches. Don't know about you, but I'm not aware of too many people with an 87-inch wingspan. Though. Maybe LeBron James, I don't know. <coughs> Plus, with that spring loaded, you can't come over here and turn your key, then quickly run over here and turn that one. That ain't going to work. So again, here we have a situation. The two of you have to agree that you're going to turn those keys. Do you agree to do that? Okay, stand up. Put your left hand on the key. Don't turn anything, I've got to tell you. Hands, hands on the key. Ooh, wait a minute. I, you know, I forgot to tell you guys something. See this, for, you see this first light over here? It's a, a green light that says uh, Launch Enable. When you turn those keys, that Launch Enable light is going to come on. And when that light comes on, you might as well say Welcome to World War III. Because there is nothing you can do to stop it. There is no, oops, switch. Still want to do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, left hand on the key. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> left hand on the key. Okay, Commander, you're the boss, so what you say is three, two, one, launch. And when you say launch, the two of you turn the keys to the right and hold them. Three, two, one, launch. Takes five seconds. Bingo, you can, you can uh, release keys and sit down. You have now started the launch sequence. Now things are going to happen fast. Launch enable light. We have the right butterfly valve lock, and the missile will no longer take any orders from us. Battery activation. 228 volt DC batteries on the missile are being charged with electrolyte. Takes 28 seconds. APS, accessory power supply light. When that light comes on, this missile is totally independent of us, and it is ready to fly. Bingo. Silo soft. That huge blast door is now starting to slide open. It went, through the, it went through the tipsy beams. That was the most visible way the crew knew that that door, in fact, was opening. Guidance go. Final diagnostic check from the guidance system. Now, in a few seconds, we're going to start pouring propellants into the first stage. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Three to four seconds later, we've developed enough thrust. Those explosive bolts will pop, and we have lift off. Think about that. From the time the two of you turned your keys to the time that missile was gone, 58 seconds. 30 to 35 minutes later, some 6,000 miles away, target number two is going to disappear under a fireball many times brighter than the sun, three to four miles in diameter. But Commander, you've done your duty as ordered by your president, but you have a few things we need to do. First of all, we've got fires in the silo. We've essentially destroyed the silo. These, these were designed for a single launch. Finally, you want to close that blast door, because with that blast door open, we're, we're, we're vulnerable. So you do that, then what we've been doing is following a checklist over there. Final item, item on that checklist is await further orders. Hmm. Well, where are they going to come from? We're in the middle of a nuclear war. Eh, the Air Force is good to us. We've got food and water up there for oh, maybe 30 days. Um, that blast valve slammed shut, so we're now on recycle air. <coughs> We think we could probably survive down here for ah, three to four weeks before we would start slowly suffocating to death. We never ran that experiment, so I don't know that <laughs> for sure. So, you know, Commander, after about three weeks, if you haven't heard anything, you have a tough decision to make. You're going to sit down here and keep your crew down here and suffocate to death? Or are you going to take a chance and go out through that emergency escape group into an unknown world? It's your call. So no, thank God, nobody on our side or their side ever had to make that decision. As scary as it is, peace, peace through deterrence worked. The, the alternative mutually assured destruction, they didn't want that, we didn't want that. Nobody wins in a nuclear war. It's only degrees of losers. With that, 
Where's my colleague? Hi, Greg. <laughs> I don't want to lose. Okay. So, 